Hello Jason, it's Tuesday, May 20th, and let me start off by saying that any hope I had of correctly predicting the outcome of the NHL playoffs has now gone out the door. And that is why you don't make predictions so far ahead of time, because a lot can happen in a few days. Despite this unfortunate turn of events, though, I'm going to be stubborn and refuse to change my mind. The Habs will win the Stanley Cup this year, with or without Carey Price. <laughs> The first thing I want to do is talk about my progress in the reading challenge, but fair warning, this is going to be a fairly depressing episode of The Rad Bromance. Partially because the first book I want to share with you is The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank. Now, if for some reason you don't already know, the Franks were a German family who sought refuge in Holland during the Holocaust. However, when Holland was eventually invaded and occupied by the Nazis, the Frank family, as well as a number of other Jewish families, had to make the choice to either go into hiding or try running. The Franks, being somewhat optimistic, decided that the Allies would probably make their way into Holland in the near future, and so they figured that hiding was the better option. To which end, they spent more than two years locked up inside of a house in Amsterdam, behind a cupboard that acted as a secret doorway. During which time, their younger daughter Anne kept a diary, hence the diary of a young girl. And so this book is historically important as the unique view of a young Jewish girl in hiding in Nazi-occupied Holland. But from my perspective, the significance doesn't end there. It's also an interesting look at a unique person, that being Anne Frank. And by combining those two things, we see that The Diary of a Young Girl is the story of an exceptional person put into exceptional circumstances. One of the great things about Anne is her self-described dual personality. Throughout the majority of her diary, she's highly self-critical and analyzes her own actions as though they were the actions of someone else. What this results in is a unique perspective on issues whether they be family disputes, Anne's burgeoning interest in boys, or the horror of the Holocaust as it's going on before her very eyes. And so, through Anne's writing, the reader is able to experience the philosophical detachment as well as the active horror of the Holocaust as it was going on. In fact, one of the most interesting, although jarring, experiences when reading Anne Frank's diary is the way that she's able to transition between talking about her crush on Peter one day and talking about the suffering of all of the Jews the next day. Or the way that one day she'll complain that nobody around her is taking her seriously, but the next day she'll reread what she'd written and call herself a fool. In Anne's world, there is such terrific horror that everything has to be open to revision, otherwise everything is lost. And so the day-to-day -day recording of the goings-on of her secret annex are a way for her to control a world that, quite frankly, is out of control. What I found absolutely most interesting about reading Anne Frank's diary was coming to the end, because we all know how this story is going to end up. And in my edition, after her final entry, we're given an afterword written by Eleanor Roosevelt that starts, Anne Frank's diary ends here. A phrase which, when you read it, quite frankly shoots straight through your heart because you know something really terrible has happened. And Eleanor Roosevelt goes on to explain exactly what that was. You know how people tend to play a hypothetical game where they ask themselves, if I had a time machine, where would I go? What would I do? Well, I have a new answer to that question. Most people posit that one of the best things you could do would be to go back in time and kill Hitler before he was able to enact any of the evil deeds which have been associated with his name. But interestingly enough, Hitler wasn't really the problem. He was just the occasion. Because of specific sanctions and the way that the world viewed Germany after World War I, World War II was bound to happen one way or another. In fact, host of QI and possible future Badass Mother Friday subject Stephen Fry wrote a book about this where a man does go back in time and kills Hitler, but unfortunately Hitler's place is taken by someone much more severe, much more intelligent, and much more capable. And so my new answer for what I would do if I had a time machine would be to go back in time to save Anne Frank, to tell her that she is so close to the end. Because she really was, if she had managed to survive in hiding for just another couple more weeks, she would have survived the Holocaust and this would have been a completely different story. We wouldn't have to read the words Anne's diary ends here, and who knows what else she might have achieved because she was truly a unique person. But unfortunately her diary does end and there's nothing we can do about that now except look back and remember the person that Anne was. In the hopes that, though we can't understand what it was like to live through the Holocaust, we can at least understand what was lost. 
Now, for reasons that I feel should be fairly obvious, I'm not exactly comfortable rating this book on a scale of 1 to 5, but I will say that it's an extremely important book, and I'm pretty sure everybody should read it. Luckily, after finishing Anne Frank's diary, I moved on to something a little more lighthearted. The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. Anyone who's ever read The Perks of Being a Wallflower or seen the movie even will understand immediately that I'm being extremely sarcastic when I say that it's a bit happier. The book is written as a series of letters between a troubled teenager named Charlie and a mysterious person who he believes will be able to listen to and understand what he has to say. Charlie's life is far from perfect, but as he enters high school, he's trying to make a change. He's trying to be positive and trying to look forward to something. Unfortunately, there are a few words repeated throughout the book that hold him back from making any sort of emotional development. And those words are, this will be our little secret. Throughout the book, a number of events occur which require Charlie to keep information from certain groups of people, and eventually he ends up burdened with everybody else's problems. To top this off, there's another problem going on with Charlie that we don't even recognize throughout the majority of the book up until the very end, and that's his own little secret, the one that's been weighing on him since the very beginning. One thing's for absolute certain though, this book is an emotional roller coaster. At points, you feel so sorry for Charlie for the things that he's being put through, but at other points, you feel like he's an idiot for not acting differently, the way that you would. And in the end, you're left with an experience which is not entirely fulfilling, but is definitely unique and definitely impactful. Earlier this year, I read The Silver Linings Playbook, which I proclaimed my first perfect 10 of the year, and it's probably been my favorite book so far, up until now. That's right, we have our next Rad Bromance Perfect 10, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And while the movie is definitely really good, it was written and directed by the author of the book, I still recommend that if you want to experience this story fully, you read the book. So having finished that book, I moved on to another one called The Unexpected Pilgrimage of Harold Fry by Rachel Joyce. And it's turning out to be pretty interesting so far. It's about a senior citizen who decides to walk clear across England. But enough about books, let's move on to Battleship. Your attack on I-6 was a hit. And I'm going to take a 50-50 shot and attack C-8. 